good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to already our fifth uh, Social Justice Forum since this past June. Um, so again, I just wanted to make sure that all our uh, computers are muted and we're gonna, we have about 110 people who signed up, probably, probably get around 70 to 80 people who will be in for today's call. Um, and again, just sit back, enjoy yourself. We have a great um, panel that's gonna be presenting today and speaking about their, their journey, um, and then we'll get going from there. Um, for those who are new um, to these forums, um, these forums were designed to fit into our FY21 planning. Um, unfortunately, the death of George Floyd um, back in, in late May um, really created this, you know, if you guys remember where the police officer kneeled on, um, on his neck for about, for exactly eight minutes and 46 seconds. It really kind of spurred us into creating something yeah, immediately. Um, we were compelled as a college to really step up and say, you know, we needed to do a fax action form, which then really spurred us into um, creating our social justice form a lot sooner um, than we anticipated. Um, but we just felt that this was a need and it had to have happened um, as, you know, during the course of the summer, which was really our off season um, for at the college, but it, it had to happen because just too many people were hurting and asking too many questions about this. Um, the purpose of these forums, um, you know, as you can see in, in our screen here, we, it's really to intersect race um, and identity and, and, and really pull it together to say what the injustices that are happening to these specific groups. Um, these forms that we are creating right now are just surface level. Um, we're just having conversations at this at the moment. Um, but what's unique about these forums is we are looking to expand um, not just our mindsets, but to also create actionable items where we can influence our circles, no matter how small or how big they may be, whether that be at your home or whether that be at your place of um, work. Um, you know, we want individuals to have these conversations that are difficult. They are uncomfortable conversations, but the purpose of this is to make these uncomfortable conversations be, we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable and having this, uh, these type of spaces and creating these spaces are valuable. Um, as the time has gone along, this is our first forum since the beginning of school year um, and it's the least attended. Um, and I'll speak about this at the end. And the reason being could be many factors. And one of those factors is we're, we're Zoom fatigued. We're, we're, our days are long, there's a lot that's going on. Um, our lives are complicated. But I want us to keep in mind as we go through these journeys and we speak today as we have in our past forums that people who through different identities and different things that have happened through hate and, and bigotry and whatever, whatever type of vitriol that we may have faced, there is no fatigue in, in our experiences. We, we, you know, we deal with it on a daily basis. Um, we see things, we hear things, we, you know, it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Right now, last night, as you see the, what's happened in the Breonna Taylor case, you're seeing, you know, more rioting and more protests because this is real. This is things that happen in, in, in all of our lot in, in a lot of our lives and we're witnessing it happen live on TV. So I thank you for being here and, and being part of this conversation and not having that fatigue because that fatigue is something that it, it's 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 something that we have to deal with as people. And I applaud you all for being here. Um, remember that these are recorded sessions. So if there are people who we feel that should listen to this, please send it to them. Um, we will get this out as soon as possible, as soon as we're able to get it captioned. So uh, from there, I would like to introduce with our moderator today, um, Chad Argensinger, who's our, um, a friend and colleague of mine at Bristol Community College. But before I get to um, introducing Chad, I um, would like to talk about some of our ground rules, okay? Um, remember that this is a safe space this is an area where we're gonna have conversation and it's not for um, us to continue this, you know, or, or speak about somebody after the fact of this. Um, we're here to learn, okay? So people are going to come from many different um, 
many different backgrounds. We have many different identities, um, political views, um, and that's okay. The reason why these spaces are created is so that we, we can have a conversation and the conversation will be um, addressed within here and then we can kind of really ponder on any of our thoughts that we may have. Just to give an idea of the way the, the, um, the, the order of events will work today, we will, um, after I announce um, Chad, or, or let him give, give the table to Chad, we, you, you'll see um, him ask, ask questions to the panelists. Once he asks questions to the different panelists and he's going through um, the, our panel, we will then put ourselves in um, a position of questions in the um, Q and A's. In the Q and A, if you have a you question have or comment, please put in question or comment, and then myself or Melissa will get to you if you would like to ask that question or make a comment. If you are not comfortable and you would like for one of us to read your question, just write in your question, and then that can, that can be a general question to the panel as a whole or it can be to an individual, just per, put it in parentheses who it's for so that person can answer, okay? Um, if you are not comfortable and, and, wanna, and you wanna send a private message, please do to, to myself or Melissa Rogers, who is the host here, and, and please just write whatever that question is and then we will um, read it out loud to the whole entire panel. Um, other than that, pretty much just make sure that, you know, um, we respect one another here in the space and then that we put our um, computers on mute and listen to the great conversation that is about to take place. Um, so again, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Chad Argensinger. He's the Chief of Staff at Bristol Community College. And the floor is yours, Chad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob and Melissa and the Multicultural Student Center. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today and to talk about um, the intersection between race and LGBT rights. If you've been attending previous panels or, and honestly, just watching the news, um, you're understanding some of the complexities that are happening in society today. So what we want to do for our time together is to layer on another level. So layer on the challenges that members of the queer community, those who identify as LGBTQIA, face in addition to that. So for some of them, um, they face different challenges. Um, for some of them, they experience all of those. So really today is meant to be a conversation with our panelists about the things that they've seen and experienced and the um, information they wanna share to help us all develop a better understanding of how those different identities uh, overlap and potentially um, amplify each other. Um, we do have a couple timeline slides that we just wanna review quickly with you. So uh, again, there's lots of historical timelines that you can find online. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight is if you think about just the past 20 years, um, there have been um, lots that's happened for the LGBT community. So it was just in 2003 when actually what was considered homosexual behavior um, was um, announced by or decided by the Supreme Court that that's no longer illegal. So before that, there were states and probably municipalities within the country um, that individuals uh, could be charged and arrested and processed for the, or prosecuted for those things. So I started 20 years ago because that's not very long ago. And as you will see, then we be, uh, sexual orientation became included in the hate, uh, hate crime prevention. Then we were allowed to serve in the military. Then we began, began to have some federal rec recognition for same-sex couples. If you're someone who's lived in New England most of your life, um, these are things that we've had for a little bit longer, but nationwide, there have not been as many um, advances that have applied to everyone. So I always say that we're very lucky to live in Massachusetts because, or I'm lucky to live in Massachusetts because I have a lot of rights that I received from the states, um, but we are just slowly within the past 20 years beginning to catch up and make sure those things apply across all of the United States. So again, here is just a, a sampling of the ones that have happened in the last 20 years. I'll highlight the one that happened this year, um, which uh, effectively meant that employers could not fire individuals simply for being gay uh, or transgendered. So it's crazy to think that in 2020, um, employers could fire someone simply for who they loved, but that is in fact the case up until this summer um, in some parts of our great country. 
So enough about the history. You're welcome to review and explore it. Um, we'll make sure those are included if, if you're interested, or you can attend one of our Safe Zone trainings and we'll talk a little bit more about the important historical events as well. What I do want to get to is our panelists. So um, they will be able to talk about their own particular experiences. Um, we've got some predetermined questions that we've talked about, but please, this is really about answering questions you have or um, adding your own perspective. So if you have those at any point, put them in the chat so we have them um, after the panelists have, have spoken. We're going to get started with Taylor. Um, so Taylor is a trans theater artist and theater major here at Bristol. She is also the artistic director of the Glass, House Pro Glass Horse Project, I apologize, which is a local theater company working towards producing social justice themed theater. So Taylor, if we could get started, could you maybe give us an example of transphobia that you've experienced here at Bristol? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I've been very lucky on campus where I've only actually had one instance that I've heard about anyway um, that has been transphobic. So I applaud the campus and like everybody involved for just like having that acceptance as a base layer already. Um, but the one time that I can think of is, uh, it happened when I wasn't even in the room, um, but I had gotten up to go to the bathroom. It was like three or four years ago. I was still very early in my transition. Um, and the teacher was taking attendance. I let her know I was there. And um, uh, when she was got to my name, she said the wrong pronouns. Um, and someone in the class corrected her. Um, and that resulted in from my understanding, a bit of a nasty exchange between her and a couple of the students. Um, and what really sticks out to me about that is, I think when people are uh, challenged on something that they may not fully understand or that they just like, it's something new and you're trying to figure it out just like everybody else. Um, people can get defensive about that and just, you know, if, I say the wrong pronouns and somebody corrects me and then I get defensive of, whoa, whoa, no, I'm not transphobic. I'm just like trying to figure it out and I start getting more aggressive and we're really not gonna get anywhere with that. Um, and on the flip side, I, I think it's important for um, the students to also approach with a non-defensive stance, a non-aggressive stance. Um, so, I think the thing is empathy and really keying into that and being able to go, oh, I said someone's pronouns wrong. Well, what's wrong with that? And how can I be a better ally to this person so I don't do this again and or do anything else that's possibly damaging? And how do we in the community um, present these things to people so that they don't feel assaulted? Or like if they do get defensive, how can we kind of quell that aggression so that it moves to a more, um, what's the word, not positive, uh, to a place where we can work on it together as opposed to just attacking one another. Um, so I think that that's really my only experience that I've had on campus, but um, I, I think if it had been approached slightly differently, there wouldn't have been that nasty exchange. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Taylor. Hold tight. We're going to come back to you in a minute. Uh, I want to move to Marty Martinez, who is a, God, I think we've been friends for 20 years, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so Marty currently serves as the chief of the Mayor's Office of Health and Human Services for the City of Boston, which is the largest agency within the city government. Um, chief Martinez oversees 10 different departments, including the Boston Public Health Commission, the Office of Recovery Services, the Boston Centers for Youth and Family, as well as the Department of Youth Engagement and Employment. So Marty, if I could, I'd love if you would feel comfortable talking about how being LGBT and a person of color has impacted your work and the work that you focus on. Yeah, so thank, uh, absolutely. Thanks, Chad, and thanks everyone for, for being here. I, I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for sharing um, your story there, Taylor. I appreciated listening to it as well. Um, you know, for me in particular, you know, my job is to be a public servant. And so my job is to support, uh, engage, and do everything I can to build up uh, opportunities for people in the city of Boston um, and break down barriers that they might experience. Um, and as a, you know, gay man and a man of color, um, it connects me to those barriers in, in many different ways. 
um, whether it's the Fair Housing Commission that's in my in my cabinet that focuses on people coming in who have experienced discrimination around trying to rent an apartment or trying to get housing um, to be accessible to them. Um, you know, they experience cases around discrimination around orientation, discrimination around immigration status, um, and discrimination because somebody spoke Spanish when they came in to look at the apartment. Um, and so we see that. Um, and I think as a professional in this work, um, you know, every day my job is to sort of do what's best for the community that I live in here in Boston. Um, but I can't help but connect my own personal story and my own personal life uh, to the issues that people are trying to uh, encounter, um, which is probably true for many of you. You know, I think all the time when I think, you know, I have incredible privilege because of the role that I'm in. I have incredible privilege as a man in many ways. Um, but I know some of the challenges that every single department in my cabinet works on to try to help people accomplish their goals, break down barriers and access opportunity. Um, and I know for many people, this intersectionality that I experience as a gay man of color, um, I can understand very, very specifically those challenges they might experience. Um, one of the departments that I work closely with is the Immigration Advancement Office. Um, and every single day, especially in the face of some of the federal challenges, they've been working a lot to sort of overcome challenges around immigration and really challenges that people are experiencing on the street and in our community. Um, and every day, you know, I'm Mexican American, um, my family, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, and so I know what that can feel like. And I can, and I also can relate to the challenges that are in front of people. Um, and so my identity itself sort of shapes myself that way, um, Chad, and, and it sort of brings that piece of work with me all the time. The last piece I'll sort of share on this question is that, you know, we've been living, you know, every day, all day, my life's been COVID for quite some time. And um, in that COVID work, uh, it has not only uh, greatly changed our world, um, but it has also shined the light on inequities. And those inequities that it has shined the light on um, are by race and ethnicity and language, um, but it's really about access and power. And so those inequities put people in places that they are, barriers are in front of them to take care of themselves, their families, and those that they care about. Um, and I see that, especially in the part of me within the communities of color in Boston, but I definitely see that within our LGBT community and access to care and access to primary care and prevention um, and access to resources to take care of themselves, um, um, not only physically, but also financially uh, to survive. So the intersectionality for me, being gay and being a person of color greatly impacts my work, um, not only my personal life, for my professional life every single day. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Gia Sanchez. So as many of you may know, Gia is Bristol's diversity and Title IX officer. But prior to coming to Bristol, she was a partner with the Pittsburgh law firm. Gia has represented clients in discrimination, civil rights, and education litigation for over 20 years. And this is including prevailing on behalf of both employers and employees in federal and state jury trials and appeals. The bulk of her practice consisted of representing educational identities. Gia, I think you want to start with a, a video first. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, 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 yes, let's start with this video. Hopefully, hopefully. We have lost a lot of folks, haven't we? We have been told to be silent for too long. Just want my piece of the American pie. The oppression that we are going through is connected to everything else. When we talk about poverty and housing. The American Medical Association has declared the killings an epidemic. Let me tell you something. Black trans women are dying. Our lives matter. I am tired. I am so tired. Each of us have a place in stopping what happens. It's important for people to know that we are here, that we're loved, and we are just like everybody else. Black 
trans person is capable of creating art, creating innovation. We are qualified to do anything. We are a resilient people. We are a fierce people. We are a beautiful people. Thank you. I wanted to start with that because I think that's more powerful than anything I'm going to say. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit of the big picture because I think it's important to understand. Uh, there's 1.4 million Americans who identify as transgender and that is 0 0.06 of the population according to the UCLA School of Law and they, they did a study a couple years ago where they uh, debunked the whole theory of trans women in bathrooms attacking uh, cisgender women. I mean, they found not a single case, but that's where that comes from. But, you know, you wouldn't have seen statistics like this a few years back because people didn't take transgender folks seriously. Uh, for a long time, we were the subject of jokes. Uh, we were deemed as mentally ill by the, by the American Association, a psychiatric association. And if that sounds like ancient history, only last year did the World Health Organization acknowledge gender dysphoria as opposed to a mental illness. Now, you see the Google video and they tell us that the American public is starting to learn about trans folks and that's a good thing, but it's not nearly enough. Um, there is an epidemic and it does hit most hardly black and African American trans women. In 2019, there were 26 deaths, murders of transgender or gender non-conforming American trans women. And that's from the Human Rights Commission. And one of the disturbing factors to me in this is things are getting worse. They're not getting better. Over the last four years, we've seen it get worse and worse and worse. This year already, um, we have 28 deaths. And, uh, you know, that was as of August 7th. So that's roughly 2% of the population. And that doesn't sound like too much maybe to some people, but I have a couple of figures I compare it to. It to, I think shows how drastic it is. Um, many of us, I know myself, is, have been touched by, by cancer, cancer killing people that I cared a great deal about, my mother and others. And uh, in 2020, according to the American Cancer Society, around 606,000 people will die of cancer. There's a, we have a population of what, 331 million? So that's 0.18 of the United States population. Uh, the FBI statistics are even uh, more dramatic. From 2018, uh, there was around 16,000 people that were murdered. And that comes to 0.005%. So think about it. You have 0.18% of the American population that dies of cancer. 0.005% of the total population that's murdered and 2% of the transgender population. It's, it's, it is an epidemic and it doesn't get the publicity or the attention that it deserves, but it is a, a crisis in our country in my opinion. So there are a few other statistics I'll touch on with you. I like Taylor talk to you about it from a personal angle, and I appreciate that. I thought she was very well spoken. I don't think I can add much to that. But the numbers, of, of, in 2015, the National Center for Transgender Equality uh, had a poll. And, you know, again, statistics just weren't available because people just didn't care enough about trans folks. And there was a, 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 over 27,000 people participated and it was a great survey. It was all 50 states. It was people from American Guam. It was from, uh, you know, military bases all over the world. And 27,000 is quite a good sample for, you know, the 1.4 million. And I, I participated in that. Uh, and the statistics, the, the feedback was just horrific. Um, poverty, people in color were more than three times likely than the U.S. Paul. The, the, the average population to be living in poverty. It was more than one third for, for black transgender Americans. Unemployment for black and African American transgender folks was four times the rate of non-transgender folks. Uh, interactions with police, which is a, a, a frightening thing for trans folks, and I'll get into my own personal experience with that. Maybe Taylor's had the same, but 
for black folks, not only was it it's scary, it was humiliating. One third of the black transgender women who interacted with police, the police assumed they were sex workers. And, you know, that's, it is what it is. Um, access to health care. 40% of the black respondents were more likely than not to see a doctor or health care provider because of cost. As if that's not a bad enough, a fourth did not see a health care provider due to fear of mistreatment. And healthcare providing providers is it's a it's a difficult thing if you're trans. Schools are not immune from this uh, as well. Uh, Seventeen percent of the people who are out or perceived as out in in um, in K to twelve. This is important because these are people we're going to see were mistreated so were, were mistreated so bad they quit school. And twenty four percent of the people who are out or perceived as transgender in college and vocational school were verbally, physically, or sexually harassed. This is a crisis. And Gia, I know that your passion for the trans community is somewhat personal. Would you mind sharing some of your own stories so people can better understand that? Yeah, sure. Um, I come from a, a, a position of privilege. I, um, I transitioned older. I was already an established attorney. I had a profession behind me. But with that being said, I have experienced harassment, some severe harassment. And I still am worried if I have to go to an emergency room or go to a specialist because they don't, so many of them don't, don't, don't understand or even worse, they're prejudiced and you, you, you wonder about the quality of your care. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a general practitioner initially until I found someone else that I basically was teaching about transgender care. And, and like in Pennsylvania, you know, much of the care was just not even covered by insurance if you were fortunate enough to have insurance. Um, the same idea with therapists, you know, it's a dangerous thing. You go to the wrong therapist and, and they're going to, it's, it's going to hurt you more than it's going to help you. And I, I know for myself, I had, to, I had to search a while to meet someone. And that's important because most transgender folks, when they're transitioning, if they want to um, get new identifications and the like, most states require you to show that you've received some sort of treatment. Um, identification is something that really drives me crazy. The driver's license and those types of documents, you know, when I, you know, I'm older and when I first began um, transitioning, I, I still worked as a man and so I had a driver's license as a man. And I had to carry a document in my car it basically indicated that I had a mental illness and that's the reason why I was dressed the way I was. I, it was very humiliating. But then, you know, we've seen states become more progressive and now some states are saying, well, you don't have to put male or female, you have to put X. And it reminds me of something a friend of mine used to say, he used to say, you know, I'm left-handed in a right-handed world. Well, I'm trans in a, in a non-trans world. Why do we even have sex on a driver's license? What sense is that? And there's a lot of things like that that you can question. But um, earlier I mentioned the Transgender Center um, for, for Equality and the founder's a wonderful woman. Her name is Mara Kiesling and I consider her a friend. She, out of her own resources, started the center back in 2003. And not long ago, the last couple of years, she sent me an email and it was so disturbing. She said she was walking down the street in Washington, D.C work time, you know, professionals out. And she was, it was broad daylight and she's worked down there for years. People know her. She's sort of the go-to person when a, when a reporter wants to have, talk to somebody about trans issues. And she had some people in a car drive by screaming faggot at her. She said that hadn't happened in years, in years. And the last four years, the statistics show that and our personal experiences show that. So yeah, that's, that's what disturbs me the most, not just my experience, but the, the, the majority of trans people's experiences over these last four years. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I, now I'd like to introduce Karina. Um, let me scroll through here. Um, so Karina is an attorney and the co-founder of FR Pride. Her legal practice has in, included representation of criminal defendants as well as advocacy for victims of crime and immigrants facing deportation. She dedicates her practice to representing marginalized populations. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Krita, could you talk a little bit about your experience with the intersectionality between the LGBT, as an LGBTQIA Latina and how it's impacted your life? 
Sure. Thanks, Chad. Um, so I am a um, first generation immigrant born here and my family is Mexican and Azorian. And so my family is both the, those countries of origins have strong histories, um, well, strong reputations, I'll say, for uh, homophobic, classist and racist um, societal behaviors. Um, and in some part, that machismo um, or um, patriarchal culture comes from colonization. And in some part, it comes from um, religious traditions um, where both Mexico and Portugal are really um, primarily Catholic countries. Um, so for me, navigating my social identities growing up, um, where the expectation was not only that I would be straight, but that I would also be very feminine and having been a first generation immigrant that I would easily figure out how to assimilate and be American and Mexican and Portuguese all at the same time. Um, my coping mechanism was to compartmentalize. So there's gay Karina, who my family knows absolutely nothing about, right? And there's my compartment of my Latinxness, right? Um, and then there's the piece of me that wants to assimilate and feels like I should belong um, because I am a United States citizen and I was born here, right? Um, so finding a level of comfort existing within my own personal truths and trying to not compartmentalize and put all these buckets together, um, it uh, developmentally, socially, um, and the word isn't really delayed because we're all on our own trajectories, but um, with my educational goals, I made specific choices educationally so that I would feel safe and comfortable. So for example, coming out of high school, I really wanted to go to Emerson College or to go to New York because I knew as a gay person, I would be very comfortable. And I ended up at Emerson studying audio engineering. Now, you just told everybody that I'm a lawyer. It's absolutely nothing to do with audio engineering. <laughs> but again, I didn't become a lawyer until I was 35. And a large part of that trajectory, I won't bore everyone with all of those pieces, but you know, I went from Emerson to the military and I was looking for a way to be all of Karina at once um, and be able to, to say that, right? Um, you know, another component of this is my gender expression. You know, you see me sitting here and I, um, I wear a gender express male, right? Um, and so a lot of the jobs that I chose allowed me to gender express male in an acceptable way to my race and family, right? So I was in the military, I was a security guard, I was an EMT. If I'm wearing the uniform and I look like a boy, well, it's just her uniform, right? So I think that, um, I'm sure this is true for a lot of the folks in our audience today and a lot of the students at Bristol, but many of the choices that we make as LGBTQ persons of color are directly impacted by the way that these different social identities do in fact intersect for us, intersect for us and our families. Um, and so, uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to speak. I, I hope that um, it, it's useful to everyone. And, and again, I'm sure that there are a lot of people uh, here in the South Coast locally with um, similar backgrounds to um, all four of us um, who um, hopefully will find um, some solace in not feeling so isolated um, and knowing that, you know, there's a bunch of old people that are fairly successful and <laughs> um, doing all right after all that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I do just want to reiterate that I often hear students talk about they want to go to Boston or New York. They don't want to come to Bristol and Fall River because we are not known as a, ex or an acceptable community for people who are, um, coming out or who have had negative experiences. They just assume uh, if you go to Boston, it'll be okay. Um, or if you go to New York City, it'll be okay. Or at least it'll be different or you'll blend in, in more. Um, and some of that has to do with the experiences they have. And I think, Kayla, did you wanna talk about more of the experiences you've had with the establishment? Um, yeah. Um, and actually I, I got thinking about this because of uh, Gia, which I love that you have all the numbers and everything. 
all like lined up and ready to go because like I had statistics like three or four years ago and I forgot all of them. So <laughs> it's good to have that uh, other piece of it. Um, but I wanted to talk about the fear of the establishment and just, you know, everybody gets pulled over. Years old. <laughs> um, but uh, there's this idea with like getting pulled over by the police that you know, there's a legitimate fear there. Um, I could get assaulted, I could get possibly killed, especially with the way police officers uh, in certain branches seem to react to things. Um, and another big fear that I have being pulled over with police or interacting with police is this idea that I'll get thrown in the wrong prison, <laughs> which is like such a weird fear to have because like, I'm not even necessarily so worried about like, oh, if I go, like, if I go to jail, I'll be very upset about that, obviously. But if it's the right one, I can at least be like, all right, like, I think I'll be pretty safe here. Um, but just that fear of somebody, you know, my license has my gender identification on it as female. I was able to change that a few years ago and get my name changed and everything. But just having a cop who can look at you and like, if my voice is particularly deep that night, they decide oh, you're just, you know, a man pretending to be a woman. So you're going to go in the men's prison and then something terrible happens. Um, and it's the same thing with like going to emergency rooms, like Gia said, where you can get in there and there's this legitimate fear of um, getting into a hospital room and hearing that you need an operation or you could die or, you know, something terrible could happen to you and having a surgeon look at you and go, I'm not operating on you. Um, you know, that's a terrifying thing, especially if you have an emergency situation. So um, for some of my friends who know me, uh, I've, over the last year and a half or so, I've changed my whole diet to be healthier. I've started going to the gym and stuff like that. And while that's motivated by, yes, improving my life and moving forward with my career in theater, it's also largely motivated by, I don't want to get sick. I don't want to have to go to a place I'm unfamiliar with. Um, I have a great place up in Boston called Fenway Health. They're all about supporting uh, trans people through their transition and helping specifically with trans health. And that's the only place I feel comfortable going when it comes to any form of medical assistance that I would need. Um, and I, I just think people don't necessarily realize like how many different fears play into it whenever you're getting into these situations. And I think that's why a large portion of the trans community has no problem at all um, throwing our support behind Black Lives Matter because it's a different kind of struggle, but there's a lot of similarities. And, you know, there's, there's this constant feeling of people trying to divide everything and, you know, been able to find certain things that we see that make us feel more connected. Unfortunately, a lot of that is really terrifying, but, um, but yeah, I just wanted to chime in about that. And Taylor, I think that sets up, sets it up nicely because I want to go to Marty next. So, um, I mean, in his role in the city of Boston, he oversees and works with some of those agencies. Um, so it's interesting to hear you talk about, you live, I assume, down here on the South Coast and you're driving to Boston for your medical care, as Gia had mentioned earlier, because you need to find someone who understands, um, and you don't have to worry when you walk in that door, what you have to explain to your healthcare provider. Um, so I wonder if Marty, if you can talk a little about how your identity impacts um, the issues that we're now seeing with um, systematic oppression and injustice, and maybe even your experiences in your work in terms of you work with some of these agencies, how do you help them um, prepare for the challenges of someone like Taylor or someone else walking into the agency and not feeling mm -hmm. safe or welcome. Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a it's a good question because I think there's there's so much um, you know at, as part of who we are, we want to feel safe and served and connected, and we want to feel like we're getting our needs met. Um, and for me, uh, from local government, uh, we want to make sure that organizations exist to be able to do that. Right, so. That's a really central piece. So I may be a gay man that's in a city role working for the mayor, 
kind of, you know, overseeing a bunch of things. But I also know that there's so much uh, resources in the community that we need to make sure um, are strengthened and supportive to meet people where they're at, um, and especially the intersection of their identity. So to give you an example, one of the first jobs I ever had when I came to Boston was I, I was a HIV prevention and education outreach coordinator for an organization called uh, Latino Health Institute. And it was a Latino serving agency in Boston that primarily targeted and served the GOBT community. Um, and it was, it, it, was, it was an organization that cut across both identities. So you could be Latino and you could be gay and you could get your services met and your needs met. Um, and actually you could you know, figure out if you were dealing with substance abuse disorder or you were dealing with trying immigration issues or we had, you know, we had groups just for identity and, and socialization. Um, and, and all of that had to do with the gay men's group or a, a lesbian group or the transgender group. All of those were meant to be able to bring in folks into a community where they could have both identities, right? So I could share that identity um, and folks, uh, whether it's about food, culture, and, and you know, being loud, which is my culture. Um, and if I could share all that and I could do it with other gay people. Um, and so I think that that's an important piece and it, it's something that I think a lot about now. So as a chief of health and human services, I oversee, help oversee the Boston Public Health Commission. It's the oldest public health department in the city, uh, in the country, should I say. Um, and it also has uh, been very bold um, in issues like needle exchange and issues specific to uh, harm reduction um, and issues that really reach communities where they're at and help people get onto paths that are going to get them healthy, whatever that means for them and get them access to resources and services. So I think that's a really important piece that I think about all the time. And the other thing I would uh, emphasize, and I'm sure that's true for the other panelists though, is that I also think I have a responsibility as a gay man of color to not forget the issues that impact my community and that I have a responsibility to do something about them. So that means whether it's in my work overseeing departments, whether it's meeting with you know, younger professionals trying to navigate that world or students um, and or that's working with organizations who are trying to meet the needs of of our diverse community. And so it's not only good for our community, it's not only the right thing to do, um, it helps people get what they need. Um, but I also, you know, I think for all of us, when we struggle and get through uh, struggle and struggle and continue, uh, you know, we have to remember whose shoulders we're standing on. So we have to make sure that we continue to do the work to give other people those same opportunities. So that's important to me and it's central um, to how I see the work that I wanna do and have to do. Thank you very much, Kari. Gia, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, some of the obstacles faced by the transgender community, and do you feel that it varies for the Black and African American trans, trans population? Push that unmute button first. I said all the important stuff already. Um, no, it, 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 it's interesting. I was thinking about what Karina said, you know, and my father was a Mexican immigrant. And if he would have been alive when I transitioned, I would have been disowned for my family. I, I don't doubt it for a second. And those are the kind of issues people face. Those are the kind of issues. And, and as Taylor said, I think there is a symmetry between Black Lives Matter movement and, and, and the trans movement. People forget when North Carolina uh, was was trying to institute the bathroom laws, you know, and and that was overturned. The protest in in the Capitol, the great majority of people were from the NAACP, you know, and and, and it's it's a good alliance, I think, you know, um, but yeah, there's it housing. There's there's so many issues, you know. When I be, we had this uh, decision this 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 summer, the Supreme Court decision that said Title VII, the employment statute, protects trans and, and, um, and gay, lesbian uh, people. And I think you touched on that, Chad. And before that, it was a crazy game. And it probably still is, really. You know, when I lived in Pittsburgh, if I drove an hour out of the city, I had to be really worried about using a bathroom, you know, because the law just wasn't there, you know. And as Taylor said, before my ID changed, I didn't want to get thrown in a men's jail. 
you know, and, and it, it was scary. It was really scary. But all those barriers are still going to exist in housing. They're still going to exist in, in, in medical care, opportunities of every sort, public accommodations. They all still exist. And, and you know, I didn't mention this when I was talking about the deaths. Something like 90% of those deaths were African-American or Black trans women. So it's even more outrageous than the, than the numbers, you know? So I think it's obviously just looking at the death statistics, it's worse for African American and black women, trans women. It, it, it's clearly worse, um, but it's no day at the beach for anyone that's trans, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult. Thank you. And I think Karina, could you share, do you have any statistics or information about um, family rejection or homelessness for the queer community that might identify in the black and brown or Asian? Because um, I think that builds upon Gia's comment or suggestion that um, black trans women are even at a higher risk than trans women in general. Yeah, sure. Um, so I know we've all been um, talking about how all, how this impacts us as LGBT persons of color, but you know, really to think about the magnitude of these issues, I'd, I'd like to start with focusing on youth. Um, so Latinx youth, when who identify as LGBTQ, are 85% less likely to complete their four-year degrees. And so if we think about that, this is an enormous, 85% less likely to get a four-year college education, right? And so I want to take a moment and roll that back and kind of unpack that a little bit with what Marty and Gia and, and Taylor and we've all mentioned here today because it's all interconnected, right? Why such a high number among Latinx LGBTQ youth, right? Well, if um, LGBTQ youth are overrepresented in the homeless population because family rejection gets you kicked out of the house, family rejection makes you want to leave early, family rejection makes you pick a college somewhere really far away where you don't know anybody and have no support system. So it's less likely that you will complete, right? Um, no support system in your community. Taylor just mentioned, you know, uh, and, and you mentioned the South Coast, the far, greater Fall River area is not known for being particularly LGBTQ friendly, right? LGBTQ friendly folks from here leave, right? So why is that? Um, the, the reason that um, we actually started, um, the co-founder Nikita Vieira and I started FR Pride was to focus on how these issues are impacting the youth in the area to prevent these dire statistics like um, lack of educational attainment, um, like in the black youth population who identifies as LGBTQ, they don't only represent a huge number in that homeless youth population, right? Um, but they actually represent 31% of LGBTQ homeless youth are black youth. I don't have a breakdown about how much of that 31% are, I also identify as trans, but that is an inordinate amount of the, of the, the youth homeless population, right? And, and we can, see, um, this is probably for a later conversation, but we can see the direct link in, a, in statistics that Marty probably uh, has right in front of him somewhere on his computer from homelessness to juvenile detention to adult incarceration, right? Um, you know, as Gia said, a, a lot of trans youth are going to be assumed incorrectly to be sex workers, right? Um, you know, and, and one thing I want to add to that um, we've all touched upon as, as you know, uh, first generation immigrants here, but um, the work that I do now is in deportation defense. Um, a lot of that with uh, LGBTQ asylum seekers from um, Latin America, Central America specifically. Um, and I think one of the conversations that's missing is you know, when folks come here because they're looking for acceptance here based on their gender expression and gender identity. Um, and then, and, and I mean, because, you know, um, 
for example, Honduras is the country in the world with the highest murder rate for a transgender person, right? So I see a lot of LGBTQ uh, asylum seekers from Honduras. Then they get here to liberal New England and they experience transphobia and homophobia and, you know, um, verbal assaults, some violent assaults here. You know, it, um, it just, I guess, highlights the fact that we also have a lot more work to do, you know, um, and, I, you know, I'm really happy to be on a panel with folks who are so engaged in social, social justice movement and social justice issues um, to keep um, promoting that uh, equality. Um. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to transition a little bit and ask Taylor about some positive things in terms of how we can move forward. But this will also be the opportunity that if anyone on the call wants to share their story or share comments or has some questions they'd like to ask the panelists, please go ahead and start putting those in the chat if it's something you want to share. Um, it doesn't need to just be the, the four panelists talking. We'd love to hear from everyone else in terms of what their experience has been or questions they might have. Uh, but Taylor, can you maybe talk a little about why you think it's important to have a queer positive attitude on campus? Absolutely. Um, so uh, I have taken like a solid decade or so to figure out who I really am. <laughs> um, so I came out in high school and I thought I was a gay man. Uh, and then, you know, I thought that I was pansexual and all this like I was tr really trying to figure it out. And then I came out as trans and realized that I could come out and I could be accepted by my family, luckily, and by many people in the community. Um, and you know what the hardest thing to come out with was? Being a lesbian. <laughs> the idea that I like women was so difficult for me to accept because there's such, there's this negative uh, ire that floats around trans people in general and it's almost like there's this expectation that if I transition and become a woman, I need to marry a man so that I am filling out this idea of what a normal relationship is um, and therefore would you know, gain acceptance in the, um, the general community, um, not just the LGBT community. And it took a long time for me to figure out that like, I could have done that, but it just, I wouldn't have been happy. There was always something missing in every relationship I had with a man. And one of the big things for me there was this negative idea of what a trans person who is interested in other women is supposed to be in these fearing minds. Like, you know, getting back to the whole, the bathroom thing that was going on a few years ago, it was trans people are monsters who want to go in the bathroom and assault people. And I mean, even that made me feel like I couldn't acknowledge my uh, sexuality because if I do, all of a sudden, they're going to start to conflate me with that idea. Um, and the only areas I've really found that I, I've walked into and I've been like, oh, this is nice. I haven't had like the chill go up my spine or the anxiety or any of the muscles tighten. Um, I've been like gay bars and going to gay pride. And I only started going to gay bars this past year before the pandemic. <laughs> um, so like, I've been really struggling to find that queer community that I could walk into and be like, oh, this is fine. This is, nobody cares about my gender identity. If I walk in and I say I'm a trans woman, my pronouns are she and her, everyone's on board. And that's so important because it's so validating to the person involved. I, and Gia spoke to this a little bit, the, um, I don't know if she talked about that specifically, but the, the suicide rate amongst trans women, trans women um, and specifically attempts is extremely high. And that's due to feeling like you're not gonna be accepted anywhere. I mean, me personally, I have uh, attempted suicide. It was years ago now, and now I'm out and my life is much better, but I wonder if that positive attitude had existed in every aspect of my life, if I would have felt like that was my option at the time, you know? Um, so like the, the positive environment, um, the positive. Oh, tell me it froze for a second. Life of Zoom. Gia, why we're waiting. Oh, 
There you go, Tara. You're back. Did, did you get the last part? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I was just saying the, uh, you know, having those negative environments and everything, um, it's really important to have that positive environment because that saves lives. It's just, you know, when you can make people feel comfortable, they're not going to fall into these deep depressions based around their gender identity or their sexuality that will cause them to go that route. So yeah, I mean, a positive environment for a trans person or a gay person is literally life-saving. Thank you for that and for sharing. Uh, I wondered, Gia, there was a question in the comment and, and the chat about the suicide rate. Are you familiar with that, the suicide yeah. rate within the trans yeah, it's something, it, 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 Last time I saw it, it's over 40%. I mean, it's, it's crazy high and it's obvious why. Um, Taylor made me laugh a little bit though with, uh, you know, my wife and I uh, went to a, um, a party of sorts. It, uh, it was for, you know, uh, the Grammys or something. And we were sitting there and my wife is five foot two and blonde. I'm five foot eight and I'm not blonde. And the peop, one of the, an older woman sitting next to us leaned over and said to something to my wife about, well, I really like what your sister is wearing. And we could not look less like sisters, but it, it, it gives you an idea. I mean, people's perception, sometimes, you know, you, you have to overcome that. And it was actually it turned into a great opportunity. I, I still think she was confused when she left, but we explained, I, you know, Diane was like, that's my wife, you know, and, and, and those opportunities do exist, but sometimes it's difficult. You know, I think Rob and I were talking about it one day and I was, I was going across the, my campus with someone else and I was really pretty new. I was in the first couple of weeks, I think it was with Aaron Wright and and somebody said, hi Gia. And I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't know who that person is. She said, hey, everybody knows who you are, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's tough because you feel like you're, you're carrying this like, you know, this mantle, you know? You know, you're supposed to be super. And it's, it's difficult. It's just really difficult and it's because of the small numbers. Thank you very much. Rob, are there some folks who want to ask questions or questions that you want to ask on their behalf? Yeah, um, I'll just kind of go through the panel and I'll start reading some questions out and I also will call on people. So I know, uh, Coach East, you have a question for the panel? Yes, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, my name is Coach East. I would like to um, thank you, Rob, as well as uh, Melissa for you know, having this excellent forum. I mean, it's a great opportunity for people to be educated and to learn, you know, that, you know, there are, you know, people who certainly encounter, you know, very uncomfortable situations. So again, you know, thank you as, as well as Melissa. Uh, my question, and I just wanted to share a brief experience. Um, about three weeks ago, you know, I was actually stopped, you know, when, when I was driving by the police. And as an African-American male, whenever you have an encounter with a police officer, I mean, you know, your heart is like pumping real fast. And my question to the panel, now Gia, you mentioned previously that there are times when you are afraid of the police. Can you please tell you know, everyone like what type of experiences you know, that you guys have you know, relating to the police? It's different for all of us, I guess. And I think Taylor touched on it very well. You know, before I, I transitioned, you know, full time, I, I still had DM on my driver's license. And, you know, it was a scary thing. You know, you hear of people all the time of police officers making stuff up for rest people. And that's why we say, I think it's stupid we have a gender on the basis because if I'm speeding as a man or woman, it's still 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. I, I don't get it. I, I totally don't get it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I worried the same things as Taylor. I ended up, am I going to end up in, in a jail with the wrong gender? Am I going to get beat up? Or, are they really? And, and a lot of times, back, at least in the past, and I haven't experienced this of late, a lot of people felt they could take advantage of trans folks because you really weren't going to come out and, 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 get in front of a group of people and say your side of the story because no one was going to believe you because you were mentally ill. So I, 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 I still get nervous when I see the police. Yeah, thanks for that. Because I think that is also true for others that 
if you are not open about how you identify with family and friends, you are not going to risk getting a ticket and fighting that because you don't want to have to admit what bar you were coming out of at the time or why you were in that area. So I think it adds another level that forces some people to say, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and go forward with this. Because if I say, why was I in this part of the town, people are going to start there. My family's going to ask questions and then I'm going to have to explain that on top of why I was speeding. Um, Rob, were there other questions? Yep. Um, so Caitlin Sylvia has a question, but also wrote a question. So I'll just leave it open to you, Caitlin, if you want to ask your question. Hi guys. Um, my question is, how, how, what was the hardest part about being part of the LGBT community? Like what, was like how was it hard for you guys like what was the hardest part about being part of, like being part of it who wants to take a stab um, at that so i'll try to add. so um being part of the lgbtq plus community is not hard being treated as a normal human being part of society by family, friends, work, cops, judges, whoever, that's the part that makes it difficult, right? Being myself is not hard, myself is easy. Um, feeling free to be myself around people who are constantly judging me and questioning the essence of who I am, that's the part that makes it hard. So I don't know if that's answered the question. Yeah, uh, I, I think for me, it, I, it's very similar, Karina, where I don't feel like being a part of the community necessarily is the hard part. I think a lot of it, you know, I live, I'm very lucky to have a family who supports me um, and uh, has been willing to support me through my transition, but I live in a small rural town um, and there's not really a huge community out here. I mean, as soon as I can yeah, as soon as all my stuff with my transition is set, I am moving to the biggest city I can find um, and ingratiating myself in the gayest neighborhood I can find because, you know, I think that's the hardest part is not feeling like I can go everywhere that everybody else can. Um, and, and having these situations where my friends years ago, they don't do this anymore because now they have learned a little bit more about things, but years ago they would try to get me to go to bars that I was really just uncomfortable with being in. Um, there's a lot of, you know, stares, a lot of, you could tell people are going, oh, what's that in the corner? Like it's, it was just very uncomfortable. And there were multiple times where I was, I just refused to go. I was like, I'm not going to go and be uncomfortable and not enjoy myself. You know, and then of course I, I had the friends saying, oh, we'll protect you. It'll be fine. It's like, well, it's not about that. It's about being able to exist and live normally without having to have my friends think they need to protect me because of my gender identity. I would like it if they protect me because they're my friends, but like, just like, yeah, just being able to feel normal in spaces. And that's why it's so important to have queer spaces that we can go to where nobody questions anything. We can just exist as queer people without it being, you know, a big showcase for everybody. The hardest part for me, the hardest part for me was coming out and not for the reasons people think. I, I was older. I knew who I was. I was comfortable in my skin, but it almost felt like a gambling game because it was like, okay, will these people still be my friends or will these people still be my colleagues? And, and it turned into sort of a game because there were some people that just didn't want anything to do with me anymore. And they weren't necessarily the people I thought were going to be like that. And it, it, it really hurts. It really hurts you to go through. It looks to hurt me. It really hurt me to go through. Um, you know, I can think of a couple people, you know, um, that, that were like that. And, and yeah, I, I, the reason I'm at Bristol is I wasn't going to go transition in a state or a place that was not going to be friendly. My sister lives in North Carolina, I kept saying, oh, apply for a job down here. It's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I mean, you know, my wife and I, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at the National Center for Transgender Equality. It's like, okay, Delaware, good. <laughs> Georgia, bad, you know, and, and it, it's crazy, you know, but I, that was the hardest part for me is, you know, some people that you thought you built up good credit with all through the years that, and, and they just can't handle it. They just, 
you lose all credibility with them. And I, I found that to be very hard. I'll just um, add one last piece that, um, you know, I know that I think of students and others, but, um, you know, I, similar to Karina, I, um, you know, I love being, <laughs> I love being a gay man and I, I love um, being able to express myself and, you know, the life I have with my husband and the ability to sort of, um, you know, press and push equity for my community. And I love that. Um, I also love being Mexican and being Latino and all the pieces that come into my culture. And I love owning that and owning those pieces and, and doing that. Um, and I also love being able to uh, talk about it even when somebody doesn't want to talk about it. Um, and what I mean by that is in settings and in places, I talk about my husband at work um, and I, you know, I'm in a position of power in city government and I can be in a room with business leaders and executives and you know, all kinds of things. And uh, I will find a reason to bring up my husband um, because uh, I love the fact that I can do that and I'm going to do it. I also know it comes from a place of privilege and I can't forget that and I own that and that's real. But um, I think that uh, I do everything I can to lean into it uh, because I have the ability to do that, which means I have a responsibility to make sure people understand that. So that's the piece I'll add to that. I think Julie has a question, but let me go to Nikita first because I think she might want to chime in on this topic. But then Julie, you put a couple of questions in the chat. I'd love to have you either ask those or we could read those for you. Nikita? Thank you, Chad. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch upon passing people, people like me who pass um, in the LGBTQ community. Um, we often face a lot of barriers and challenges that are extremely hard to go through. Um, for example, to what the police topic, right? I got pulled over and one of the first questions in the lineup is, well, not really questions, but more like insinuations like, oh, I'm surprised you don't have a few children back there. And the first thought I had was, well, why, why would you assume that I have children in the first place? I'm a lesbian, you know, like I didn't have children at the time and I was in a fully committed relationship with my partner. And it was like, uh, this mind opening experience for me that, you know, I do have these different challenges that I'm going to have to go through as a passing lesbian woman. And similarly, that goes for any other aspect of my life. Many people would be like, where is your husband? How, wh how are you doing things without this man in your life? And I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not married, you know? Um, but you know, these issues we do, those are some challenges that people who pass end up going through on a daily basis, you know? So that's my little tidbit, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, just wanted to contribute. Well, so before I go to Julia, I promise I'm coming to you, Julia. I think that's an interesting notion because oftentimes members of the LGBT communication can pass. Um, my husband tells yeah. me all the time that there's no way I can pass, but I honestly think that there's some settings where I could pull it off and pretend. Um, but I just think that that's an opportunity for some of us that if we're in those spaces where we don't want to put ourselves in that uncomfortable and have to have the conversation, right. we can. But I, I like Marty, Marty's comment that those of us who have the ability should really utilize that power because it then begins to, um, I don't know if I want to use the word normalize, that you don't always have to assume that um, when I have a wedding ring, on, wedding ring on, it's because I have a wife. Um, I can have the conversation about my husband and people begin to realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't just make those assumptions. Um, but I think that's what's unique about this population versus some of the other forms we've had. Um, it is potential that some LGBT members could just pass and you probably work with them and have no idea. Um, it's because they right. haven't come to the point where they want to share that with you yet. Julie, you have some questions that you want to ask us or we can ask them for you, whatever works best. Sure, I put them in the chat, but you know, my daughter and I are listening and we're just wondering if you have any idea how accurate the data is in terms of how do people really identify, especially as being trans and, and if, is there, are those numbers even reflective of how many people are actually, um, you know, living, living the life of being trans, but not necessarily in the data and, and potentially, um, you know, struggling with different intersectionality and, and certainly discrimination. Do you have any idea? 
I'm guessing they're low. I, I'm guessing they're low. I think, um, I think Taylor put it very well. Is it? It's a, I, it was for me at least, Taylor, like you. It was like an evolution to figure out who I was, and and so I think some people they're still figuring it out, and they may be in denial or they may not want to indicate that. So I, I think the numbers are probably higher. So I would agree with Gia um, only because you know a lot of these surveys. Um, they're really small groups. I think one of the largest surveys I saw was out of the uh, University of Connecticut, and that was a little bit over 2,000 folks who responded, right? Um, for all the reasons listed, it's difficult to get folks to reply honestly, not just because they're still um, transitioning within themselves, but also because um, if you're not out to your family, if you're not out in this particular setting, you're gonna be really reluctant to write that down on a form, no matter how many times it tells you that it's an anonymous uh, data collection survey, right? So I would assume that for all of these data points, the numbers are gonna be slightly, if not, hopefully not dramatically higher than they already are. Because if we have a low response rate, think about that, if we've got a low response rate, and we know 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ, and 31% of those are black kids. I, don't, I mean, I can't imagine what those numbers would look like if they were accurate, right? Uh, so I just want to put it out there. We've mentioned, uh, Nikita and I mentioned the term passing. Um, so for those of you who don't uh, quite know what that means, Gia, do you want to take a stab at it? Sure. Uh, passing, passing can be a controversial thing in, in the trans world, at least the folks I know. Uh, passing means that you are attempting to not not appear to be trans, basically. You know, I would be like right now uh, trying to pass as a cisgender woman. You know, and so, and and I, I think that's a a good question because some people don't want to pass; they're fine with being who they are. Some people do want to pass, but there are a lot of words like that. So I don't, I think that's a good question. Yeah, and Chad, I just want to circle back to the racial component of our conversation, right? Because the term passing actually yeah. comes from um, the, the negative connotation and implication of being a lighter skinned black person that was somehow able to, to avoid certain areas of discrimination because you could potentially pretend to be white in that specific situation. Um, for, for the same reasons, right? Like it's, it's, it's frowned upon and yet sometimes it's thrust upon people as what Nikita was describing. And it's, it's also interesting because you brought this up a little bit too with, um, you know, passing within the trans world is like, it comes kind of back to that level of privilege of, you know, people always talk about passing privilege where I'm very lucky in my situation where I can go into most places now and not have to worry about my gender being a question for people. They see me and they go, oh, that's a woman. So there's ways that like that can be beneficial, but it also plays back into the privilege argument of, you know, I may be part of an underprivileged group, but I have the privilege of not being questioned. And I also, I have, I'm white. So I have an additional privilege on top of that. And it's just, I don't know, like passing is always an interesting topic because it, it's at both times super negative, but can be somewhat positive depending on where you lie on the identity spectrum. But I, I would just say, right, that for, from my perspective, I think that to what Marty said, right, like if you find yourself where you're in a situation where you can either pass or where you are accepted or slash tolerated because you're in a position of power. So now that ability to pass, actually, we have that responsibility, right, to pay it forward, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Robert, there's some other questions in the chat. So, um, Julie, I know you had a second part of the uh, question here. Would you want me to read that out, or would you like to ask it? Oh, sure, I'll ask it. I mean, generally, I was just wondering, you know, I know the most basic advice is that we should be empathic, we should be accepting. Um, but from an institutional perspective, when we look at uh, barriers and obstacles, what should we be trying to do when we're talking about the intersectionality of race and LGBTQIA identity? And what kind of barriers at Bristol or at the state level or the national level should we really be trying to address?
Anyone want to take a stab at getting started at that? Panelists or others, we're welcome. I'll take a stab at the national with, at least from the trans perspective. I mean, we're seeing it now. I mean, we, we need to have greater protections and greater opportunities for trans folks, you know? Um, like I, I mentioned before, insurance, you know? It really shouldn't be a question, you know, if a, a trans man wants to have top surgery and they're working somewhere, why isn't their insurance covering that? Uh, so there's, there's, there's a dialogue with a whole bunch of different things, I think, for, for trans folks on, on the national level. So if I could speak to the local level a little bit. So um, I think we definitely need to focus, you know, so local, regional, we need to figure out a way to support LGBTQ identified youth and youth in general, um, specifically folks who are at this intersection of race or ethnic cultures, right? We're in gateway communities in Far River and New Bedford, right? So we can never forget that. And that translates directly into Bristol, right? If we're not supporting middle school students, high school students, that's gonna be our Bristol population, right? And so we need to have a safe space. We need to educate not just the teachers, the guidance counselors, the coaches and the parents, right? And we need to be able because we're in gateway communities, we need to be able to present that education. And this is this part's tricky, right? I certainly don't have all the answers, although I know I'm full of suggestions today. <laughs> but we need to be able to educate in a culturally competent way. And that means across different ethnicities, right? Folks that are gonna have a religious opposition to this um, because of their, uh, you know, uh, countries of origin, all that we, you know, we don't have as anywhere near the strong supports that Providence or Boston have, right? And we shouldn't have middle schoolers and high schoolers who are transitioning with a supportive family drive into Boston in order to get safe health care or feeling like even as an adult college student, I want to get away from here because this isn't a safe area, right? Like if we're going to build up our community you know, we are the community. We're, we're, we're from here. We ought to be able to get our education, stay here, uh, and it would benefit the economy if we then became homeowners and taxpayers and, and participated in the, in the overall econ economy and progress of the region. Um, I don't know that I can necessarily speak to any barriers that still exist, um, but there were, a, for a couple of years there, uh, I was an officer in the Hero Club which Chad is the advisor for. And um, in that, just in that small time frame that we were there, we pushed and got, you know, preferred pronouns on attendance lists and uh, on the website. Um, we helped push for uh, better training in regards to LGBTQ people uh, with the school. And one thing we fought a lot for, <laughs> um, it was, came up in almost every meeting, was trying to get more uh, symbols of pride out on the campus. Uh, the one that we mainly focused on was trying to get a, a rainbow flag up. Um, we ended up getting up for at least one month and I actually I think two months. Uh, um, you know, so the having the student body like lay down some of those foundations and having the administration work with us was super important. And I think that um, the more the administration can do to reach out to LGBT students, the more they can learn and help adjust and help just create an accepting environment for students to go to because not everyone is like me and has a family who supports them. Some people go home and they get dead named and uh, have the wrong pronouns thrown at them constantly. So I will just chime in there quickly because I, I think that uh, some little things go a long way. So I know Julie's been through our safe zone training. So attending something like that and getting your decal and publicly displaying it. Uh, I know when I was a college student, when I looked around and saw those symbols, um, it said enough to me that I knew that this is a place that I could be myself. So you don't necessarily have to move mountains, but little things like that, I think send a very strong signal. Uh, I know today when we drive around and look at different neighborhoods, we're looking at some of the signs and things that we see. So we want to live in a, in a community that has some Black Lives Matter signs up because then those communities are more connected. So it could be as simple as um, putting a safe zone sticker or choosing to attend those trainings so that 
all members of the community know that this is a, a safe space for us. Robert, there's some other questions we want to address. Yep, so the next question is from Rose, and it says, thank you for putting this panel together. Uh, my questions are, one, for those, um, for those of us that consider themselves as LGBTQ plus allies, what is it that we can do to best support you? And alternatively to that, um, is there anything that you don't want us to do, although it may come from a good place? Just speaking from my personal experiences, um, it's very nice when people uh, are just trying to get to know you, trying to get to know your pronouns, trying to make you comfortable. But one thing that's super uncomfortable is uh, getting told the profuse level of apology, you know, having someone make a big scene out of doing the wrong thing and having to apologize for it. That's not something that they intend to do is build a scene and everything, but you know, if that person is um, really not trying to draw attention to themselves in a moment, and then that all gets thrown out the window when somebody is, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It's, you know, we care that you try, but I think it's um, uh, a little crazy to like, you know, feel like you need to go like way beyond where you need to, <laughs> to be supportive. I agree yeah, with I, that. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Hey, Karina. Okay. Um, I, I agree with that. And I think that can go pretty far. I, I like one of the things I don't like to see that I think happens with a lot of trans women, it's happened to me, is this comparison, you know? Oh, I thought you were, I thought you were a cisgender woman. It's like, oh, that's a compliment, really? You know, and I think people need to think, you know, just, just treat us like what we are. I would just answer that a little bit more macro, right? Like if you're an ally um, and you're in a situation or in a conversation where somebody is making a homophobic comment, a racially charged comment, a derogatory comment about people of a particular ethnicity, speak up, right? If you feel like an ally and you're in a position of privilege or power, you don't need one of us to be around to hear you do the right thing or to witness you do the right thing, right? So the more people who actually are LGBTQ+, plus, who speak up and say, hey, that's wrong, or the more people who actually aren't Black or Latino or Asian and say, hey, yeah, that's not funny, that's just racist and disrespectful, you know, we normalize the, instead of normalizing racism, we normalize anti-racism, right? We normalize, you know, um, being anti-homophobic, right? And feel free that if you're uh, not on the panel, but you have some thoughts about what you've seen work well and not work well, um, please feel free either to, to chime in or add that to the chat. We'd love to hear that as well. We I have a um, private question to ask right now. Um, so it was sent to me in a state here. As a high school instructor, um, what are some ways, sorry, the thing is scrolling up and down here. What are, uh, as a high school instructor, what are some ways, methods that I can uh, use to ensure that any LGBTQ students in my class um, see it as a safe space? This is especially important to me because this is, um, because this is often the age where they can gain independence and beginning to face some struggles um, when their choices may not um, be respected or valued at home. There is a... I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> you this time. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, so small things like safe zone stickers, right? Um, like you, your high school may not make an issue about pronouns, but in your classroom, you can just ask everyone what pronoun or what name they would prefer and just make that a ground rule in your classroom that everybody respects that. Um, so I, I would start with, with small things like that. And I think that if that is a, um, a, a ground rule and a steady structure that you, you maintain in your classroom, then students will feel safe at least there in your 
little little world of the, of the high school. There is a website called Teaching Tolerance, and it's fabulous. That's exactly what it's for. It's for um, K to 12, and I mean, I think it's adaptable. I think we can use it as well, but it, it goes through the, the ways that you can as a professor, as a, a teacher, that you could be supportive by what you what you have in your curriculum, uh, the books you use, the movies you use. There's, there's a, a list of things you can do, including something like making sure that you have a, a safe zone sign or something that indicates where you're coming from. And I'll just echo that again. I mean, I wish that when I was a college student, um, some of the examples that my faculty members used were more diverse. Um, so for some of us, it could make us look like we're really hip if we're using the current uh, characters from some pop popular TV shows and our math equations and other, or other things. But I think for some students, they're going to see that and they're going to realize that we intentionally chose to put um, and two individuals who have gendered names in a, in a word problem. Um, and many other students, I don't think will notice that, but I guarantee that the queer student in your class is going to see that and say, oh my God, I can't believe that they chose to use these two names. Like it is going to light them up and they're gonna be more engaged with that material simply because you switched out some names or you use something that is another way for them to connect to that course and that material. Yeah, and uh, just to echo that, Chad, like it, it comes back to representation and it doesn't matter what subject you teach. It can be, you can have LGBTQ people in your word problems, in your questions, um, in the curriculum without uh, sensationalizing it. You can just have it be a normal part of it where it's not just, oh, I'm putting this out here for these students. It's that you're trying to normalize it so that, you know, the numbers don't have to be equal, but there are representations of heteronormative stuff and then there's representations of LGBT stuff. So, um, yeah. So the, um where and the next question I have here is, do we feel um, like within our own community, we need to do more to help people understand? Anyone want to tap meaning, on that one? meaning within the LGBTQ community? I believe so. It's, it's not written here, but I, I believe so. Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think to each of us to our own ability and to the degree that we feel comfortable but um yeah the the i i think the only way to achieve um and i see that this it you know maybe the word isn't tolerance but to achieve um understanding right is that you know if i want you to understand me we have to relate on some human level right so you may not end up liking me. I may not become your favorite person, but in order for you to at least respect me, I have to engage you in some conversation, right? And so um, I will sometimes get asked personal questions that I'm sure women in heterosexual relationships don't get asked. And I tolerate that invasion because I feel you who are asking me this question, you've probably never met a gay person before. Or if you have, you've never felt like you could ask that question of that. So the folks in the community, yeah, we each have a little bit of, an, of a responsibility um, to different degrees, of course, to, and I say to different degrees because, you know, some of us here are working in uh, acad acad academia. I, I'm an adjunct, I only teach one class. Um, but in, you know, my full-time work as a public interest attorney, I'm always trying to highlight these issues of inequality when whatever whenever whenever they come up which is pretty frequent as i'm sure you can imagine right and in my class i try my best to structure my class in a way that is as inclusive as possible right but again in in personal life and day-to-day -day conversation even though it's exhausting sometimes and even though sometimes it can feel offensive to get asked some things that i know other people wouldn't get asked um but if I don't tell you, or if I reject answering this question in this moment, what am I leaving you with, right? How do I move this forward for you or for us? So I think to a certain degree, it is our responsibility. 
Yeah, and just to chime in on that, I think that um, I think that you're right. It does somewhat fall on our community to take care of this because, you know, you hear the phrase you you have to meet people where they're at, and it's not always easy, and sometimes you just can't. Um, but I have met many people who are friends of like you know, my sister's new husband or friends of my brothers from work where they would tell my siblings, I'm not comfortable with trans people. And then they'd be like, well, come meet my sister. She's like, she's weird, but she's fine. Um, and uh, then I meet these people and just meeting a trans person for the first time in a normal context and being able to go, oh, you're a normal person like me. Okay, that's now I kind of get it. You're not this monster that's been created. Um, and that it's so important to try to meet people there because, you know, not everybody is where you're at. So it's just, it is part of our job to try to push that forward. No. Yeah, I, I, th I also think that when you can and you have the opportunity to address a larger audience, it's, it's a good thing, you know, I, I've had to push myself a couple times to go talk to groups of non-trans people about trans because you know we're going to be a trans person, honestly, you know, and you know sometimes I think it turns into that, you know, ask the trans woman a question as opposed to the presentation, but I'm okay with that because I think as as Taylor and Karina said, it normalizes it, you know, they feel like okay, I understand it a little. Rob, is there maybe a, one more comment or something we want to end with? Yeah, so um, we probably have about another eight minutes um, here. So I have a comment and then we have two more people that have quick questions. I think we can get to them. So this one is um, on the topic of passing. I am bisexual, but I am married to a man and I am cisgendered woman with feminine pronouns and, and who presents herself as feminine. As a result, I have been in many situations throughout my life where acquaintances have made insensitive jokes about the LGBTQIA people. I appear straight, so sometimes people around me would think it was all right because uh, no one would be offended. I came out um, one time a half an hour after the joke and immediately the reaction was, I'm sorry. But it was troubling, the joke was even made in the first place, regardless of who I am or who was there. Powerful. Um, next one is uh, Cochise. You had a, a comment. Oh, yes, Rob. Yes. Um, Karina, you mentioned, um, you know, the word responsibility. And I just wanted to say, you know, to you that, you know, I agree 100 percent because, you know, it's our responsibility, you know, particularly when you are around family and friends. And people don't realize that you have power. And what I mean by that is that when, when you hear inappropriate comments about the LGBTQ community or you know, other um, inappropriate um, statements, it's your responsibility to call that person out. And a lot of times I have gotten into trouble and I don't care because if I have a family member who says something that is derogatory in regards to a particular community, I'm going to call you out. Okay. And I just want to end by saying that we have the power. And if someone is close to you and they make, you know, inflammatory comments, you can shut them down by your power. Oh, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, uh, again, this, this conversation is about uh, intersecting race and, and LGBTQ plus issues, right? And so, um, you know, uh, from from a Latinx perspective, right? Latin people, most Latin Americans are Black Latin Americans, right? But because of colonization, because of the slavery and the indentured servitude that occurred, um, and the classism, there there is a embedded racism and colorism within all Latin American um, um, countries, right? So you take those layers, um, which already exist in your family, and then you come out as gay or as trans um, or uh, you know, as a lesbian, bisexual, whatever the case may be, and you're compounding it. And so often 
that's the, 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 the place where you feel the most pressure to stay quiet, but the most important place with people who know you, right, for you to speak up and say, hey, you know, I've, I've had it in, in, uh, happen in my family, right, where somebody make a derogatory comment about uh, an African-American. And I'll say, well, you know, you know how you feel when you get pulled over, right? So it's this, it's not, it's not different, right? Like all you're doing is the same thing to them, right? And so it, when we compound these issues and layer them, it, especially for youth, um, it can be really hard to feel powerful or to feel empowered when you're in a position when you're actually financially dependent on your family and you have, you know, what's the option? Do I stay here in this place where I feel oppressed? and unaccepted. And in, in some cases, um, uh, we've, we've been contacted at FR Pride in some cases where there's actually been physical violence on LGBTQ plus um, kids of color within their homes um, because they try to come out to their families. So, so what's their choice? Do they stay in this environment? Do they try to speak out or do they silence themselves? You know. Thank you for that. And lastly, we have a, a question here from one of our students. Um, if someone is in the middle of transitioning from one gender to another, and you see them being picked on, what is a good way to help them? I think it depends on how they're being picked on. I think as um, we talk about in Safe Zone and some of the other things is, if you can insert yourself into the conversation and redirect the conversation, that's great. Sometimes you can't just call somebody on something. Sometimes that just is not viable. And it also may make the transgender person feel very uncomfortable. So I think that, but it, it depends, you know, if it's something really outrageous, you know, you may want to interject and say, hey, that's, that's no way to speak to anyone, you know, but so I think it depends on the circumstance, but I think it always works to, to try to redirect the, the conversation because if, if the person making these comments they, they are going to understand what you're trying to do, I think. Thank you very much, Gia. Uh, anything else that you see, Rob? No, I think right now we're pretty good. There was a couple of just direct comments that I think people are just saying overall about liking the space. And uh, I think we're ready to get to our next uh, next phase here. Wonderful. So, Gia, I know that you had provided some uh, resources that you wanted to share. So as Melissa pulls those up on the screen, um, could you talk about some of the resources you've identified for folks? Maybe on mute. Yeah, Gia, do you want to talk about these? My best stuff is coming when I have the mic on mute. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, this is, if you know someone who's, who's trans, this is, a, a, particularly if they are transitioning or whatever, or they're just coming to terms, this is a great site. I mean, I use this site when I transition because it has every state's laws, how to get a new license, how to get your birth certificate changed, all kinds of things like that. And very supportive people. And besides, I really like the executive director, Mara. So that's a really good resource. Thank you very much, Gia. And Karina, I think you had some resources you wanted to share as well. Oh, you're on mute as well. <laughs> There you go. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, the first link provided is to the FL Pride website. Um, right now, due to the COVID-19 debacles occurring, um, we're not having um, meetups yet. Um, but we, we will be starting um, meetups soon um, via Zoom, more likely than not. Um, this is focused on youth. Um, primarily targeted at high school students who are transitioning, coming out, or unable to come out because of their family environments, so that we can start to create safer spaces um, here in um, the South Coast region. region. Um, and just a couple of books um, that I thought um, 
might be helpful. Um, Julia Takes a Breath um, is about a uh, young um, Puerto Rican girl who comes out um, as a lesbian. And Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe is a little bit more fluffy um, coming out story. Uh, Aristotle and Dante are two um, Latinx uh, young men who um, uh, meet each other and uh, fall in love. But they're effectively coming of age stories that I thought your panel might enjoy. Thank you very much, Karina and Gia. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you all today. I want to turn it back over to Rob so he can wrap us up. So thank you, Chad. Um, again, uh, can we give a round of applause to uh, Chad and to our panelists? It just um, this reaction button on the bottom, hit the clap button and show the love. It was an absolute um, fantastic forum. Um, and, and remember that you know, these are important conversations and these forums are really built right now as we're going, we're speaking about the surface level of these intersectionalities. And the goal of these, of, of these great forums is to really pull, you know, to really kind of start this conversation. And then eventually we're gonna really look at some specific items where we're gonna kind of really take a deeper dive into these um, topics as we move forward. And as you um, see in the screen here on July 2nd um, was after we did our initial George Floyd and, and talk about police brutality um, on, earlier in, in the month. We, on July 2nd, we did our police and criminal justice. Then we did our race and educational and equity, our race and women's rights. And then we did our race and LGBTQ rights today. And then our next one is October 22nd, which will be race and disability and mental health rights. So that one is pretty large. Um, but we're trying again, again, they're open conversations where we're trying to look at some intersection and we're also looking to start the conversation. And as time moves along, we'll, we get, we'll, be, we'll narrow it down and be a little bit more um, specific. As you can see also in November, there will be another um, forum, which will be race and immigrant rights. So there's a lot more to cover um, and you're gonna see it's, it, it, there's, it's robust. There, there's many things to kind of speak on. Um, our next steps are you will receive tomorrow um, for all those who have subscribed to our newsletter and who's, who's been part of this form, you will receive a newsletter that will have um, not the copy of this one, but should have a copy of our last form because that should be captioned and ready to go. We will have our different links and, and, and some of the items that you saw that Karina and Gia shared will be part of that newsletter, as well as the video that um, Gia shared and other resources for you. Um, these are built in, so whether, if you're a professor, um, a student, or you know, a staff member, or in other industries, you should be able to utilize these resources in order to help you to influence your, your, your areas of expertise, or just at home as well, to share it with your, your, um, your kids. Uh, today, Julie said that her and her daughter were sitting down and listening to that. My son has been part of many of the forums listening as well, although he doesn't want to come on camera. He just sits in the background and listens. But those are, these are great opportunities to really share um, these conversations with your family members, um, friends, and so on and so forth. Um, to learn more about multicultural affairs and social justice and everything that we do, um, you see on the side here is our email address that you can contact us at any time. Um, we have been meeting with tons of professors, people from other EDUs, other for, um, consortium members from Leading for Change. That has been tremendous the amount of um, uh, attention that we have been getting here and really kind of really spreading out the word. Um, you all have parts to be, you all have strengths. If you would like to um, talk about those types of strengths and how you maybe you can help us in future forms, please do so. If you're, you're looking at ways that you can influence your classrooms or something, please do so as well. And we can kind of either come in, have a conversation, or we can help design certain type of things and work with you. Um, if, you know, time permitting, we can do that. Um, I thank you guys. Chad, again, excellent uh, today moderating. Um, couldn't have done that this without you. Um, Taylor, Gia, Karina, and also uh, Marty. It was excellent. Um, uh, and if anybody needs anything, you know where we are. Um, please follow us on Twitter and all our social media networks, and we will go from there and keep fighting, everyone. It's, this is really, really important. Um, as everything is coming down and as we're watching the news, it's, it's awful out there. Um, but our positive minds, our souls um, 
coming together and creating the space of positive energy will help change this world little by little, um, but at least we know that there's good here and we'll continue doing that good work. So thank you um, and have a great weekend. We'll see you guys October 22nd. Thank you.